Okay, so we are now recording. I know I've showed it before, uh, setting up the pallet, but since I have to set it up, I may as well show it again. Pallet knife is a worthy investment. Um, I think mine's 50 cents. I start with laying out a dollop of Pro White. I always work on the paper towels because it allows me to keep wet paint a lot longer. I don't like re-wetting my colors when they're dry. The paint has a different texture. And I work fairly heavy with my gouache. I don't work in a lot of transparent uh, washes. I, I tend to lay the paint down pretty heavy, so uh, re-wetting the paint doesn't allow me to do that. My That was cadmium lemon. My permanent yellow deep is just about gone. Come on. Gonna have to pick up my fresh tube from my office next time. There's the permanent yellow deep. And that's officially spent. Yellow ochre, which is the base color for all of our yellow metal. I will use up a tube of these. I'll use up some of these colors in two semesters. Some of them will be good for more than a year. Paint will last in the tube for years if the tube doesn't get exposed to air, if it doesn't crack or something. Actually, I'm a little out of sequence there. I'm supposed to put down the Van Dyke Brown next, but on my hand, grab the neutral tint because they look the same. They're both similar looking tubes. That's the Van Dyke Brown, that's neutral tint. That's the full palette. Ready for work. Because I am painting stone today, I will be using colors. I use the 18, uh, 18 color uh, field sketching kit from Koi. It's not particularly great, it's not particularly bad, it's particularly affordable. It's important to use cake watercolor. The consistency of the paints is different uh, than two. Okay, so um, in order to paint a cabochon, um, I will paint a, guess what we're going to cover, we're going to cover cabs. I'm going to paint a round and an oval cabochon. Of course, I did not keep my needed erase map. Easiest place for me to find those here. Oh, this is funny after I move the camera. <laughs> it's actually down at the bottom. Okay, I'm not going to do that because that's just silly. But actually I am. Bear with me one more time. Those of you on YouTube watching this, that's my nose. Deal with it. Fortunately, I did not close down the software again this time, so all I will have to do is flip the, the camera orientation in the software, which takes sadly two clicks. Do not hit the X. All right, here we go, good. Yeah. 
That's where I want to be. I have, right here at the bottom, I have a round and an oval, side by side. The oval's a little long proportionately for what you will normally get with a cab. But the size isn't bad. I'm going to start by outlining with pencil. Remember, one of the beauties of the Opalux vellum is that you can trace through it. Which is particularly, as a student, guys, it doesn't matter that much because, of course, you have nothing but time. That was a professor joke. Um, so you can transfer onto opaque paper to your heart's content. But when you're in the studio, the design studio, the ability to trace on the fly is really useful because you're making changes to designs all of the time. And if you have to keep transferring each time, it's really annoying. Okay, I'm going to do the oval as a peridot. I'm going to do the round as an uh, amethyst. Amethyst is the hardest to paint. Uh, it has to do with the nature of pigments. Purple pigments um, do not uh, glaze very well. Um, you tend to get a um, kind of a muffled grade effect. So I'm just mixing a strong um, purple color. Uh, it means a lot of pigment. And I'm going to fill in the circle. Please, since I do not have my glasses on and I'm focusing on what I'm doing, if I suddenly take the whole thing out of the camera uh, field of view, somebody yell at me. Yell nicely, but yell nonetheless. For amethyst, you want a nice true purple. Not too warm, not too cool. When you refer to colors in terms of warm and cool, uh, a cool purple would have more blue in it. And a warm purple would have more red. Amethyst is right down the middle. Okay. Now that looks a whole lot darker um, than what I have on the paper. Um, that is part of the joy of the technology, unfortunately. I can't duplicate exactly what I'm doing here. Um, we've tried playing with brightness settings and what have you and have not gotten anywhere really constructive in that process. Since we are doing colors, I will try. Brightness and contrast didn't do much for us, but we did play with saturation and got some improved results in the other class. So I'm going to go ahead and kick up the saturation. Yeah, that does help. That gives a little bit more of a purple. A little bit closer to what I'm dealing with here. Um, the peridot, do you know what color peridot is? Anybody tell me what color peridot is? Say that loud. Green. What kind of green? Warm or cold? Um, warm. That's right. It's a yellow green. Peridot is a yellow green. Um, but it's usually not a brilliant yellow green. If you ever see a brilliant yellow green, you're probably looking at a demantoid garnet. So I'm going to use three colors to mix this. By the way, you should try never to use more than three colors in a mixture. If you use more than three colors in a mixture, you're going to end up with a muddy or grayed color. I'm seeing if I have a dark olivey green. I don't, really. Um, Maybe you. I'm, when I find what I'm looking for, I'll move it into the camera. Till then, there's not much of a point. Yeah. The cheapest pigments are thalocyanide pigments, but you can get both in blue and green. 
and phthalo greens are what you usually get in inexpensive sets and those are blue they have a strong cold cast you can see that is is a is a a phthalo sort of green and, and it's it's got blue and we don't want blue we want that warmer yellow which we don't have any other warm yellows so i'm going to make it warmer by mixing it with yellow ochre i don't want to use a lemon yellow or a bright yellow because it will give me a really vibrant yellow green and we don't want that peridot is kind of acidic it's kind of the color it's kind of earthy that is a nice peridot green Same idea. I will just knock that in. And then I will let that dry. Um, the diamond I did in the other class ended up being um, rather dark so I kind of wanted to correct that I might take the chance to do that while it was drying and use the center circle here um, right here that's a pretty good sized diamond that's um, over to carrots but still uh, faceting a diamond, guys, is interlocking squares. The important thing is, is to have the two squares be fairly equidistant from the girdle, their points. Something like that is good. Then this one interlocks. Its points are going to come to about the same distance from the girdle and if you do that you should have a fairly credible table and star facet arrangement and then if you just draw little kite shapes coming off the stars those will be your bezel facets and if you want to get into enough detail where you split the upper girdles you can do that okay that's how you would facet around okay I will not go into a lot of detail on this because I do hope to get the, power, the flower painted as well today. It's optimistic of me. Um, you want a gray wash to cover the stone. That's just neutral tint, no white paint at all. Just neutral tint, but you want a fair amount of water. You want a, a pretty soupy mixture. Okay? And you want to pull that brush out on a blotter, a piece of clean paper or dirty paper doesn't matter until the brush is almost dry that way when you come in here and you lay in the wash it hopefully won't be too dark now if you notice, the paper was bubbling. Do you see the paint bubbling up? It didn't want to stick. Opalux is not supposed to do that. Traditional, good old-fashioned Opalux never used to do that. Then they started to treat it so it would work better for wedding invitations and whatnot, so it would take different inks better because Opalux has more value to Canson as a uh, printing paper than it does as an artist supply. Uh, it made it impossible to paint on, and I had to stop using it. We complained, and Opa and uh, Canson actually changed the formula back for us, supposedly. Sometimes I still have a problem with it. 
If that happens, just scrub the surface. It's a coating. <coughs> and as a coating, it will wash off. Um, it can also be the oil from your hands, though. This is an old piece of Opalox. It's been floating around my office for a couple of years. So that could just be oil from my hands on the paper. If there's oil from your hands on the paper, that will also act as a resist and prevent the, the watercolor from soaking in properly. So whatever it is, make sure that you just scrub it until it lets, you, lets the pigment soak. I'm mixing neutral tint and uh, purple to get a nice dark purple color, okay? Now, it doesn't have to be really, really dark. Um, it depends on the material you're making out of. If this was a tourmaline, I would actually make it less dark. Uh, the less contrasty it is, the less uh, uh, refractive it is, the more sparkly it becomes. Um, sapphires and rubies have a lot of contrast. Diamonds have a lot of contrast. Amethyst quartz has a fairly high amount of contrast. Tourmaline, not so much. Aqua, barrels, not so much. So you can actually help indicate the species of stone by the level of contrast you put in. Now it's going to be hard to see. I just put in a dark um, paisley shape into the stone in the upper left quadrant. And I'm putting in a uh, crescent to the lower right. Hopefully that shows up better than my eyes without glasses looks like it does. Um, for the peridot, peridot is going to be not quite as stark a contrast, but still strong. I'm going to use Van Dyke Brown and that phthalo green, that cooler green, just so I can get a deep dark green color. I want a green that looks something like that. And I just stuck my finger in neutral tint of all the days to do that. Okay. So, I always blot my stroke out, my brush out. I'd rather come in for two coats than make a mistake. So I'm going to do the same thing here. This is a lighter color, so the technology should convey it easier. This was a cool green from the watercolor palette, because I didn't have a dark warm green, and Van Dyke Brown, like so. And like so. And if you can see it now in the light color, it should be a little easier to see in the purple. It should show up a little bit better now that you know what you're looking to find. The diamond, I'm going to go a little bit darker with the gray. In the upper left-hand corner. Not a lot. Just a, a, it could even be the same color of gray in a separate coat, in a second coat. But I want to come in up here and I want this shading to come in under the table a little bit like to here. I don't want it to come past the center of the stone. Something like that is fine. Okay. While those dry, I'm going to come over and draw on the flower a little bit. I do not have time to paint a full flower for you. Uh, this is a freesia pendant I designed years ago. Um, but I can catch this center flower. Pencil is just a support for me, so I, you know, 
like I have a double line here, I don't care. The paint is going to be the finish tool uh, that I use, so. I would like a little bit more material there. It's just to help me to keep from completely losing the design once the paint gets heavy. In fact, because that is the case, if you don't really know for sure how you're going to shade your piece, you could come in with your pencil and do some experimental shading first. For example, if I wanted to check and test what I thought the shading on this bud might be. I could do something like that just to verify myself. The paint's just going to cover it up anyway. So it's just a way of me checking it first. Okay, back to stones. The next step on the cabs is white paint. Pure white. So, I'll get some white on my brush. I'm going to paint an outline. I try not to paint the whole outline the same. I give a good outline on the upper left, the lower right, and then I use broken dashes and dots to kind of put in the rest. Okay. I'm going to come into here and I'm going to paint another paisley shape. Similar to the dark one. I do want to leave a little buffer of that original green surrounding it. And I do want these whites to be as opaque as I can make them. So if I have to do more than one coat, I will. On an oval, I'm going to put a somewhat elliptical highlight. Kind of tubular. and an accent highlight here, and maybe another small accent highlight in here. I'm gonna come in and crisp this up a little bit within the uh, second coat. I don't wanna lose my pencil line, so I'm gonna be careful not to paint it out. And if I think it needs it, I can do a second, um, like a reflecting line. Depends on the size of the stone. In a little tiny stone, you wouldn't do much of this extra stuff at all. In a big stone, you might do more. Something like that. Repeat for the amethyst. All these FIT desks are slightly sticky, which makes moving the paper around a lot of fun. And somehow I have 
moved off of my original drawing. There we go. Right. Same idea. By the way, notice how much white paint is on that brush. It's heavy enough that the, the, it's dead opaque, but you can still see bristles through it. Okay, that stroke started out a little heavy for what I would like to do up here. So I broke it, I stopped it. If I were a student like yourselves, I would stop right now and blot out that brush a little bit on my scrap paper. Uh, if you've got a lot of experience, you can keep right on painting and you just adjust the pressure in your hand to accommodate for the crazy amount of paint that's flowing. But as a student, you want the tool to do the most of the job for you. So if your brush stroke is doing something that's, that terrifies you, it's well worth your time to stop and readdress the brush. Okay. There's some furriness down here at the bottom from how I laid down the uh, purple. I'm not going to paint over that with opaque paint. With, uh, if I was painting a bezel, I'd just paint a bezel over it or something. In Opalux, you can use a razor, uh, like an X-Acto blade, and you can actually scrape it up. So you can erase if you want to. Coming in, up. and around to capture that paisley form. This is a larger stone, so I probably will pick up a second tier of line like that. And maybe a little more coming into here. Like that. Uh, I'm going to do the highlight on around. It'll be a round highlight. It'll be up here quite close to the center. An important note on jewelry rendering. Actually, a great big highlight that, like that, if you're actually doing illustration, is wrong. The harder the material, the brighter the polish, the smaller the highlight will be. This was very frustrating for me when I came from illustration into jewelry because they would show us, you know, how to do this and I'd be like, but that's wrong for the kind of material it is. But because we're painting small and because we're working in layers of glazes and whatnot, if we don't give a good strong highlight, it just gets lost. Okay, so purple especially, it's important to get good opaque whites because like I said, the white, the purple glazes aren't wonderful. So I'll apply a second coat here and here. Coming up to the diamond. You paint the pavilion, oh, I got a arrow mark to that. Uh, you paint the pavilion first, so once again, just white. The diamond is nothing but neutral tint and white. I'm going to come in and I'm going to paint diagonal like wedges coming into the center. I'm going to paint diagonal lines coming in, radiating inwards as well. It's nice to have some different weight to these strokes so it doesn't get too mechanical looking, too regimented. They don't all have to make it all the way into the middle.
but this circle of reflecting is what you want. Okay. I also do uh, outline the diamonds in a similar fashion to the uh, cabs. Come around the top. A little more liberally around the bottom. And some sparkles. And that's done. Coming back down to the cabs. Next step is a glaze. This is what scares people the most about painting stones. You have to do a wash. You can do it with a small brush. I'll do it with this. I have a, I, it's nice to use a larger brush. I'll do the oval with the smaller brush and the round with the large. I don't specify in your supply list that you have to get a larger brush because you don't. And they can be, they get expensive. I'm going to go back to the original color that I used to make the peridot, the original yellow green. I might freshen it up a little bit with more of the warm green from the palette and maybe even a little bit of cadmium lemon from the gouache. So get kind of a slightly more electric yellow green. That's nice for the wash. You don't want it for the base color, but it's nice for the wash. Pull most of that water out of my brush because that much water in your brush is a bad thing. I'm going to turn the design upside down. Because when you're pulling the wash, you want to start the wash. Uh, the drawing underneath is no longer aligned, but that's okay. We don't need it. Except for I'm no longer in the camera. Okay, then. Like so. Uh, you want to pull the wash starting up here. And working your way across the stone. If you start to pick up white paint or the brush starts to dry, get fresh color. Because what you don't want is you don't want chalky. You don't want to feel like the white gouache um, harmed your glaze. Okay, You can see already that right there I have this little divot of color. I will try and pull that out a little bit, okay? You don't want to glaze too little. You don't want to glaze too much. It's tricky. Um, you want the color to be deep enough that it looks like the species of stone. If the color is too dark, the stone will quickly look dead. If the color is too light, the stone will look chalky. Coming in with a second glaze. Like so. That's not bad. The amethyst, same idea. I told you the purple is not a great glazing color. It isn't. Mix fresh purple, no other colors in there. A fair amount of pigment. Pull that brush out good. I don't want it to flood. And actually, I said for this, I was going to use a larger brush. I will. The brush I'm using is a number four. It's also a Raphael. It's the same brand, same series. Uh, it's a rather expensive brush because of that. But I can get it to hold a lot more paint and a lot more water which means I won't have to reload it in the span of a stone or two. Pull most of that wetness out and you can see the difference in the scale. It's a much larger brush. And once again I'm going to come in from here. I want my brush strokes to initially follow the form and then I usually do diagonals 
See those light colored strokes that are happening? That is white paint being picked up in the glaze. When I see that, I stop. Come back in. And resume my glaze. The key of this, guys, is practice. Do not be tormented when the first few stones you do die in the glaze. Because if you flood them with water, that's what they'll do. It'll become tie-dye. And if you don't have enough water when you come in, they'll become very streaked and the white paint will get moved too much. Some movement is fine. I actually, let, actually kind of liked the direction those were going, so I let them blur. Like I said, amethyst is one of those colors that is very hard to get a nice wash on. I am going to come back across this area. It's very tricky. It wants to pick up the white paint. That's not fully dry yet. So me touching it right now, it's not very smart. I'm a professional. Do not do this at home. Uh, you should let it dry completely before you come back in. Here we go. Amethyst Peridot. Okay. Now I'm going to go into the diamond. Which is going to be tricky with a purple brush. And paint the white facets on the crown. So I have to hope I can still see them. If not, I have to draw them with my brush. In fact, you really have to draw them with your brush regardless. I will often draw these twice. Once in neutral tint to establish the pattern, and then in white to fix any errors and to finalize the drawing. That's fine to do. Be careful though, when you do it, you actually get a darker stone. There's really kind of no way not to. That's a good start. Don't worry if it's not perfect. This is not a CAD drawing. If you, if you do these in Painter, using a Rhino support drawing or something, then yeah, you'll have complete precision. This is not that. This is hand-painted gouache. So some irregularity is going to be there, and it should be desirable. If your client wants machine precision, they should let you do a CAD rendering. And you will, by the end of the semester, know how to do a CAD rendering, if that's what they want. The white facets, I am going to accentuate. I will make sure the white paint fully fills the area that they contain. I want nice crisp points, so what has happened here where it's bled into these is not ideal. But this is a live performance and you're painting and whatever happens, happens. I'll also pick up this facet in white, sometimes, sometimes not. Depends on what I think the stone needs.
there are also dark facets on a diamond crown. One or two. It depends on the size of the stone, the placement of the stone, and your general mood. Uh, these are painted using neutral tint. Straight from the tube on your brush. You don't want it to be too heavy, but you want to be able to draw well, so... These facets are important to get crisp and right because it's this effect of one layer of the diamond floating above another that gives the diamond the effect of transparency. I'm going to come in and reinforce whites. At the end of the day, you want this diamond to sparkle. You want it to be brilliant. You want it to be white. So I will come in and I will re-accentuate highlights. I'll add some faceting. I'll put a uh, couple of highlights along the edge. I'll pick up on this triangle inside the pavilion. I'll crispen up the side of this floating facet. I'll bring some harsh white here. I'll bring some strong white there. I'll tidy up this facet line. Okay, And that's pretty good. That diamond is working quite well. I want to touch up the, uh, the dark facet that I overcorrected a little bit. Right here. Done. Okay. Now if you compare that round diamond to the one I painted earlier in the week, see how much darker that is? That is a more correct range of values for a round diamond. Okay? A white diamond. Down to our cabs. Cabs are almost finished. They just had to dry really well before I did the next step. So I left them alone. You have to put your highlights back onto your cabs. If you're asking why I glazed over the highlights, it's because it was smarter than trying to glaze around them. Trying to glaze around a highlight is very dangerous to do. You're going to be scrubbing with that big paintbrush and you're going to be knocking up the paint underneath. So it is much smarter just to let yourself come back as a final step and reestablish your highlight. How many highlights you want to freshen back up, it's up to you. I feel like this would do well to have some light brought back in here. I think it would do well to have a secondary highlight in here. And maybe a little bit of light under there. It varies with the stone. Okay. Same thing with the peridot. Nice elliptical highlight. I thought the other one I stretched out too much, so I'm going to let it not go all the way, which is fine. It'll look like a, a highlight that blended, which is nice. Auxiliary, an auxiliary highlight would be good here. And maybe here. 
come in and pick up some light along the edge and pick up some light along the edge. Done. Now for the, uh, the diamonds finished, they're finished. So the last thing I have to do is to paint the flower. Okay. And all the moving and shifting, these drawings have really started to fall from their position. So, in order to alleviate me having to fight it, does anybody have just a piece of white paper? Piece of notebook paper or, or sketchbook paper, anything else? It can be small, big. Thank you. Appreciate that. Since I'm not going to use the underdrawing anymore anyway, I'll just cover it up. So we don't have double lines to make it difficult, more difficult to follow. Uh, just like you, working with the other shapes, I'm painting this in yellow today. Yellow ochre to start. Yeah, see, I think the problem I was having with the purple stone as far as the paint soaking in, I think it was skin oil because it is from being handled because it's not doing the same thing here. Over here, I'm having no resistance from the paper. Like I said, it doesn't matter. Whatever was causing it, the solution is to just wash the surface of the paper with your brush which you have to kind of do when you put the base coat in anyway, so by the time your base coat is down, it shouldn't be a problem. We won't be doing these renderings uh, demonstrations much longer this semester. As you know, we've been discussing ideation and coming up with ideas primarily as homework. This is to prepare you for the next portion of the semester where we will be doing technical drawings and colored renderings. So this is to expose you to it so you can be practicing it ahead of time. But later in the semester, we won't be taking time out of class to do this very often at all. That's the base coat. In the interest of time, I'm going to be working wet into wet more than you should. You should let this dry completely between each level. Mixing my shade color, which is Van Dyke brown and yellow ochre. First thing I'm going to go for is, is low-hanging fruit, things that I know need to happen. I know this petal overlaps, so I know there needs to be a shadow. I know this overlaps, so this is going to be in shadow because it's overlapped again there. I perceive there'll be a shadow in there. Okay, those things I can tell. Where this petal comes in front, there's going to be a shadow. Pick up my drawing here. Reestablish some of my drawing that's getting lost behind the paint, which is a constant process with your rendering, guys. If you feel like you're losing your drawing, you need to come back and, and replenish it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I feel like there would be a shaded section here. I feel like this area 
would likely be shaded. <clears throat> I feel like there would be some shading coming in here on this petal and some shading around the edge. Some shading around this edge. A little bit of shading in there. This is basically cylindrical with a rounded bottom. So I would do kind of dome shading at the bottom and coming into cylindrical shading here. This is the same idea. It's kind of a cylinder that ends in a couple of small domes. And it's a very common thing in floral jewelry. This cylinder that ends in a, in a round bottom, kind of a dome form. When I'm dealing with a section of wire like this, I'll just do a twining shadow. Comes from one side and up the other, like so. I'd like to have a little bit of shading on this petal. I think I'll do that there. Now I'm gonna come in with light. Light is just permanent yellow deep and white. You want it light enough to stand up well against the yellow ochre. So if it's just going to sink in, and you have to let it dry for a minute to see, like that. If it's just going to sink in, you got to use more white. And sometimes you use a lot more white than you want to, because uh, it starts to look really pasty on your palette. Um, if that happens, it means that probably you didn't have your yellow ochre opaque enough and it went down as a wash. And thin yellow ochre is not as bright as thick yellow ochre. But you have to take a look and decide if you think it's light enough. It actually dried lighter than I thought, so that wouldn't have been too bad. But I have mixed a lighter puddle of color. And I'm going to use it. Light comes up here, comes onto here, goes along there. I feel a large pool of light here. I feel kind of striations or bands of light, almost like a texture. Coming into here, I feel like the top of this petal is in light. And then it kind of rounds off. I feel like this cylinder form here starts to catch some light part the way down. And on this more underneath petal as well. I think that there is light on the top of this bud and on the lower part of the bud. I think there's light coming up on this twisting reflection on the wire. I think there's a dot of light there, just cuz. I think there's some light here, some light along the edge. I think there's a nice strong area of light here, kind of a reflection line here. I feel some light there and some light picking up here. Okay, Those were the easy lights for me to see. Now I'm going to come in and get some of the less easy lights. Um, light along here. I'm going to put some light starting at the top here, but it doesn't go down all the way. Some light along the edge. I'm going to put a reflected light. Thin line of light bouncing in from the environment along here. I need some kind of light on here, so I'm going to bring it here. 
some more of that texture here. A mm, little bit of texturing in here. A couple of lines. Reflecting line. I want the edge of this to be lit up a little bit. This becomes tricky because this is kind of all in shadow under here. It's not really going to get hit by light. So I've got to catch the edge of it with light, like that. Reflected light along the back side of this petal. Like so. This is tricky because there's a lot going on over here. I'll just put in a little bit of a line to show there's some detail that I don't quite understand. Reflected light in here. Little reflected light in here. A little reflection of line here, just some detail. Reflected light there. Reflected light here. This edge of this bud got lost. So I'm going to get a little bit of light to pick it up. And just a sparkle there. Done. Okay. Now what I want you to notice is that that form is pretty much clear right now. You can feel that, can't you? And I haven't used my two most powerful values yet. That's the key. You want your form to read before you pull out the big guns, which is your core shadow and your highlight. Because if it's reading now, the next step is just going to make it pop. And that's what you want. So core shadow is neutral tint and Van Dyke brown to make a chocolate brown. I myself like Girard Deli, 60% choc cocoa, chocolate chips. They're my faves. This is exactly that color. Come in and figure out where I want that. I want a, I want a core shadow in here. Core shadows are good to show extra fullness or roundness of form. They're also good for particularly deep shadows. And i.e. things overlapping other things. You got to find a reason for them on your piece. If you're not sure where to put one of these, do some preliminary sketches and figure out where those cores would be because if you don't have a core shadow, your gold's going to seem very pale and your piece is going to seem flat. These dark darks really help your piece get some volume. Personally, I kind of hate these kinds of demonstrations because the question that's going on in everybody's head, if I'm not mistaken, is how does he know where to put that? It's like he has somebody in a headpiece telling him, hey, now put a little there, put some over here. Guy doesn't seem to even be thinking about what he's doing. He's just dropping in dark color. I'm cheating. That's the whole 25 years behind the paintbrush thing. It's true. I mean, this is not really hard for me to do because I've done it so many times. Honestly, I hate to admit it, but this is fun for me to do. Okay, the last value I need to add to this is the highlight. Highlight is white and cadmium lemon.
you want it potent, you want it to jump, so you want enough white in there that you have good contrast. Notice how thick the paint is on that brush. That's scary, but your choice is to either come in heavy like this or to do multiple coats. Either one is a valid approach. Obviously coming in heavy requires more confidence because things are more likely to go wrong. If your brush starts to buckle and bend in strange ways, you have to add water because it's the gouache drying in the bristles and making it less cooperative. Now, if I were to critique this, I would say that I got too much white in that light yellow, the permanent yellow deep and white, and it made it go kind of pale and orangey. It's looking okay on the screen, but on the original rendering, this gets a little pastier than I would like it to. So, uh, but that happens. I mean, you're never going to look at a rendering, well, not never, but you're not always going to look at a rendering and go, wow, I got that just right. There's usually something about it that you would rework if the client wasn't at your door waiting for it. And that's okay. That's pretty much done. I'm going to put one more core shadow in because I see a spot that needs it. it needs a core shadow right through here. That's done. Okay? So uh, those are the renderings for today. Um, uh, there are my cabs. There's the flower. There's the diamond. Okay, I'm going to shut down the video.